Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at the initiation of translation, the process of translation, ending translation, and then we'll finish with a summary. So translation is the process that happens after transcription. It's the second main stage of protein synthesis, and it involves transferring the genetic information that's now on the mRNA molecule, and we turn this into a string of amino acids to then make a protein. So in transcription, remember what happened is we took the DNA molecule that's stored in the nucleus, and from this, we made a strand of mRNA in transcription, which now holds the information that that gene and the DNA needs to be able to hold. And this sequence of bases will be turned into a protein as it's read. And the process of reading the mRNA and turning it into a protein is translation. And a protein, remember, is a series of amino acids arranged into a certain order, which then folds up into a specific shape to carry out a function. So the mRNA is made in the nucleus, but it enters the cytoplasm through the nuclear pores, and then it associates with a ribosome, which is a type of other RNA molecule forming a large structure. The ribosome is made up of two subunits, a large and a small subunit. And first of all, the mRNA binds to the smaller subunit, and it does this at its first codon or the start codon, which is always AUG. So to illustrate that here, we've got our mRNA molecule, and it's made up obviously of lots of nucleotide bases of four types. A, C, G, and U instead of T. So in DNA we have T, in mRNA we have U. And there's always a start codon, which is the first codon that's going to be read by the ribosome, and then we bring the first amino acid to this one. And it's always AUG. So here we have the AUG codon on the mRNA, and it's here that it initiates with this here, which is the small subunit of the ribosome. So this is the complex that forms first of all. Once the mRNA has bound to the ribosome, the codon then gets read by the tRNAs. So the first tRNA molecule, remember tRNA is what each carries the amino acids individually. The one with the correct complementary anticodon, which in this case is going to be UAC, then binds to the start codon by the hydrogen bonding. So remember with the tRNA molecule, we have one end which binds to an amino acid, and whichever amino acid is bound is dependent on the anticodon that the tRNA has. And the anticodon is again three nucleotides, just like a codon. And this is going to be complementary to the codon on the mRNA. So this is the codon, and whichever one is complementary will form hydrogen bonds with the tRNA. So here we've got a start codon, which is AUG, and that's always the same start codon. And then the complementary basis to this would be UAC, because they're the only other types of bases that would bind to these. Any other bases wouldn't be able to form efficient hydrogen bonds. So this is now what's happening. We've got a complex with the small subunit of the ribosome, the mRNA, the tRNA's anticodon bound to that codon, and that tRNA's carried amino acid on the top. The first tRNA molecule always has the anticodon of UAC, and it always carries the amino acid methionine. So any polypeptide that gets made has the amino acid starting it, which is methionine. So most polypeptides begin with met or methionine, but it can be clipped off later when the protein is finished. So some proteins are found without it. Once this is all formed, then the large subunit of the ribosome binds, which is much larger than the smaller subunit. And this whole complex can then begin translation. So from this point on, we can start making the protein or the polypeptide that we're trying to form. So here we have our large subunit of the ribosome. So the process of translation is kind of like a repetitive cycle, which has multiple steps, increasing the length of the polypeptide that we're making. So at this point, we've got a ribosome that's been fully assembled with both of its subunits, and now a second tRNA molecule with the complementary anticodon to the second codon can then bind to the next codon. So what we have here is we have our original complex with our first tRNA with the methionine, and now what we need to do is we need to increase the length of the protein by adding the next amino acid. So the second tRNA molecule comes in, and the anticodon that it has binds to the codon on the mRNA. So again, it will be a specific type of tRNA carrying a specific amino acid, which in this case we'll call alanine. So now we have two tRNAs bound, and we can now start forming a peptide bond. So again, the second tRNA carries the specific amino acid coded for by the codon. So each codon is going to be complementary to a specific anticodon, which will only carry a specific type of amino acid. Between the two amino acids, we now need to link them. And the link between two amino acids is called a peptide bond. So a protein is made up of lots of amino acids joined by peptide bonds. 
So we form it between the first two amino acids, and making a protein with two amino acids gives it the name of a dipeptide. So then what happens is the methionine, which was the first amino acid, can be released from the first tRNA, and the formation of that peptide bond uses energy derived from ATP. So we've got the peptide bond between the two amino acids here, and this tRNA is now free to go and do other jobs. So then what happens is the ribosome just needs to continue moving along. So it moves along the mRNA strand by exactly three base pairs at a time, so one codon at a time, and this first tRNA that we had is released. So you can see here that we've got the moving of the ribosome along the mRNA so that it will now read codons one by one. The second tRNA is still attached because we're waiting for the third one to now bring the next amino acid. We can't have it leave yet because it's still attached to this second amino acid. Meanwhile, the first tRNA leaves so it can go and do other jobs. At this point, because the ribosome has moved along, the second tRNA molecule is now in the same position in the ribosome as the first tRNA molecule was when it started, but now it has a dipeptide attached to it. So think of the ribosome as a large 3D complex shape with a slot for the mRNA, and it kind of moves along like a kind of checker. And each time it will do this, the tRNA will move to the opposite direction in a certain position of the ribosome where it holds the growing protein. So then, as you can imagine, the third tRNA comes in with a complementary anticodon with its own specific amino acid binding to the next codon. The first tRNA molecule has now gone, and it's gone to pick up another amino acid, methionine, to then be used later on if it's required. So here we have the third tRNA molecule coming in to this next codon to drop off the third amino acid. So the cycle repeats over and over again with tRNAs coming and going, and then going off to pick up their next amino acid and coming back. And this forms a long polypeptide. And you can imagine this polypeptide could be many hundreds of amino acids long, where tRNAs keep coming back and dropping off particular amino acids. Once the ribosome has moved away long enough from the start codon on the strand, then another ribosome complex is able to attach at the start codon. So the reason for this is if this ribosome has moved along and there's now space at the start codon for another ribosome to come in, this is good because it can start translating a second polypeptide. So usually when mRNAs are released from the nucleus, they're often not only read once, they're read many, many times because often it's not just one single protein we want to make. It might be several. For example, if we're making a protein like collagen, collagen is made up of lots of polypeptides linked up into a rope. And having one molecule of that just wouldn't be any use at all. So we have to have many millions of them. So we have second ribosomes joining at the start codon, again, which is AUG. And the same process happens with them. This one is completely separate to this, but it's the same mRNA molecule. But it will start making its own polypeptide until it's ready to go. So as we said, this results in the same identical polypeptides because it's the same mRNA and the same codons being synthesized at the same time or simultaneously from the same mRNA strand. So you can imagine we've got a big trail of ribosomes along the same mRNA strand, making the same polypeptide, which will get released later on. So when does the protein stop and when does translation end? There are no tRNA molecules with a complementary anticodon for the stop codons. So remember there are three types of codon which are known as stop codons. And stop codons basically code for the end of the protein to be manufactured. So this would be U, G, A, U, A, G, and U, A, A. All of these are the stop codons, and eventually these will be reached when the protein comes to an end. So because there's no tRNA complementary to this, there's no anticodon complementary to these stop codons, none of these tRNAs can bind, and therefore no amino acid will be brought. So the synthesized polypeptide is released from the last tRNA molecule because nothing else is there to bind onto it. Usually what would happen is the next tRNA would come on with its amino acid and then a peptide bond would form between that polypeptide and the next acid. But in this case, the stop codon doesn't have any complementary anticodons, so nothing comes in. And as the ribosome moves along, this last tRNA is released and the amino acid that was at the end is released. So the whole polypeptide is now finished. So at this point, what's happened is once the polypeptide has been released, the ribosome subunits separate from the mRNA strand, so that's both the large and the small, and then they get reused for another round of translation. So for example, we might have the large and the small separating out at the end, 
but they could go back to the start codon and begin translating for another polypeptide. So this is all to maximize the efficiency. Meanwhile, as the ribosome is disassembling itself, the polypeptide, which is now released into the cytoplasm, begins to coil up and fold into its specific tertiary structure, which is determined by the amino acid sequence. So remember, a polypeptide has a particular order of amino acids, and this order of amino acids is known as the primary sequence, or the primary structure. And the primary structure dictates how this folds up into a tertiary structure made up of lots of alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. And that specific tertiary structure is what gives the protein its function. At this point, the polypeptide may also start binding to other polypeptides or prosthetic groups if this is a protein made up of lots of polypeptides, making a protein with a quaternary structure. So for example, with hemoglobin, we would have two alpha chains and two beta chains, and this would fold up into a large hemoglobin molecule with prosthetic heme groups in the middle as well. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap revised smiley face, and together, let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.